You probably already knew this, but sim racing is an expensive hobby. You can spend thousands building out a rig if you're aiming to get the most immersive and realistic experience. But the question is, does expensive sim racing gear actually make you faster? In today's video, I'll be comparing an entry-level wheel kit to a much more advanced system to find out if investing in high-end equipment is actually worth it. Hey pals, welcome back. So the Logitech G920 is still the most popular racing wheel on Amazon, and it's not hard to see why. It offers a great experience for the price and provides an easy and accessible entry to the hobby for a lot of people, myself included. I've been using the G29, which is just the PlayStation compatible version for the last year or so, and I've really enjoyed my time with it. However, I recently upgraded to the Logitech G Pro Wheel and Pedals, which has some big hardware improvements such as a direct drive motor and low cell brake, offering an experience much closer to driving a real car than the belt driven system of the G29. Oh, and it's also five times more expensive. So you'd be right to question if these upgrades have actually made me faster. So today I wanna to do a little experiment to see if having better gear has made any significant improvement to my lap times. To ensure I'm producing meaningful data, I'll be driving on six different circuits, starting off with three practice laps, followed by five time laps, which we can then use to calculate the mean average time for each wheel. I'll be playing Gran Turismo 7 as that's the game I'm most familiar with and should lead to the best results. Just for fun, I also decided to include a DualSense controller to see how using a gamepad compares. As for the car, I chose to use the McLaren 650S GT3, which is a pretty great all-rounder that I really enjoy using, even though it hasn't really been in the meta of the online multiplayer modes recently. I threw on a pair of medium tyres and kicked things off with Trial Mountain, which has been in the franchise all the way back since the first game was released in 1997. Obviously it's a fictional track, but it's a Gran Turismo classic and it's got a bit of everything, so it felt like a good place to get started. I ended up streaming the first part of this test, which was a lot of fun actually. I really enjoyed talking to some of you directly, and it was cool to share part of the process of how I made these videos. So let me know in the comments if this is something you'd be interested in seeing more of on my channel, because I'd definitely be keen to do more live content in future. Anyway, after using each wheel at Trial Mountain, I repeated the process at Daytona, Spa, Red Bull Ring, Mount Panorama, and my personal favorite, Suzuka. Before I dive into the results, I wanted to share a bit more about my experience using these various controllers. Going back to the G29 was pretty eye-opening. It's only now that I've gotten used to the Pro Wheel that I've realized how much you actually compromise with a lower budget wheel. There's the obvious stuff, like the annoying startup calibration and the lower build quality, but there's also a lot to be said about the driving experience. Using a belt-driven system means the G29 can feel quite notchy, and the amount of detail you can ascertain from the force feedback is quite limited. There were a few times where I got on the power a bit too early, and the reduced fidelity meant that I couldn't feel the car was about to oversteer until it was too late. The smaller wheel diameter also isn't very comfortable, especially if you've got larger hands, and the buttons just feel a bit crap to be honest. Don't get me wrong, I wouldn't expect much more at this price, but I would only really recommend this wheel for beginners to see if sim racing is something they'll actually enjoy before investing in a nicer system. I was pretty impressed by the Playseat Challenge X, however, which is half the price of the trophy and could be folded up and easily hidden away when not in use, making it an excellent choice for those with limited floor space or if you're trying to keep your partner happy. There's a lot of adjustability, so height shouldn't really be an issue. However, the seat is a bit narrow and I do get a bit of an ache in my legs. So if you're on the broader side, you may want to keep this in mind. Something I love about the Challenge X is that the wheel mount has a hinge, making it much easier to get in and out of. I just think this is a wicked product and having a dedicated sim rig is a massive improvement over using the built-in desk clamp in terms of immersion and overall enjoyment. So you're probably wondering how the driving experience of the Pro Wheel compares. Well, it's definitely a lot more realistic. The direct drive motor is capable of producing 11 Nm of torque, which means you're really fighting it sometimes. The feedback is also way more detailed, particularly when true force is enabled. This technology pulls data from the game's physics engine and then translates this into more textured vibrations to simulate things like energy response and various track surfaces. I know this is also present on the G923, which is the latest iteration of Logitech G's budget wheels, but I would imagine the experience isn't anywhere near as refined. Having a low tail brake pedal means I can accurately apply a consistent level of pressure rather than trying to guess the amount of spring travel, which is a big improvement over the G29. The pedals are also fully adjustable, so you can move them around for better spacing, and you can swap out these springs and elastomers to customize the amount of resistance and travel to suit your preference. By the way, always remember to wear socks, bareback in the pedals is never okay. I've mounted the Pro Wheel and pedals to the Playseat Trophy, which isn't quite as lightweight as the Challenge X, but feels a bit more appropriate for a direct drive system, while still being portable enough to move around my living room after I'm done racing. I've had this rig for almost a year now, and for the most part I've been really happy with it. However, there are a couple of things I think can be improved. The seat is wide enough to provide ample support of someone of my size, and the more lateral driving position is super comfortable, which helps to prevent fatigue so you can maintain focus and immersion throughout longer sessions. However, it isn't really height adjustable and may not be the best option for shorter users. The cable management is also quite poor. They could have easily added channels inside the tubular frame, which probably wouldn't have compromised the structural rigidity. Instead, you have to use these Velcro straps, which just feels a bit basic. Finally, I've noticed that over time, the bottom section actually moves away from the seat as a result of hard braking force. 
It attaches using plastic clamps, which you tighten using a hex key. However, no matter how much I screw these in, they just aren't strong enough to hold, which is a bit annoying. And then there's the DualSense controller. Obviously, this isn't going to provide the same experience as using a wheel and pedals, but I know a lot of people don't have the space or budget for a dedicated sim rig, and I learned a lot about racing using a controller, which I'll talk about more in a minute. So let's get into the results. At Trial Mountain, I set an average lap time of 154.8 over my five time laps with the G29, which I was able to beat using the Pro Wheel and pedals with a 152.5. The DualSense came in with an average lap time of 154.2. Up next was Suzuka, where I set the bar with a 205.8 using the G29. This is a very technical circuit and I struggled to piece together my laps using the DualSense, only managing an average lap time of 207.6. I was able to shave off over 5 seconds from this with a flying 201.6 using the Pro Wheel and pedals. Starting off with the DualSense controller this time, I set an average lap time of 222.7 at Spa, with a slight improvement of a 221.7 with the G29, before once again finding pace with the Pro Wheel by setting a 220.3. Moving over to Daytona, my average lap time was a 148.6 using the DualSense controller which I then sailed past with the Pro Wheel, setting an average time slightly under 147, before finishing off with the G29 at a 148.4. But what about tracks where I started off using the Pro Wheel and pedals? Well, down under at Bathurst, I set a 208.2 on the Mount Panorama circuit, which surprisingly I then beat with the DualSense, setting just under a 208 before the G29 finished strong with a 206.6. At Rebel Ring, I was actually pretty consistent across all controllers, setting an average of 131.2 with the Pro Wheel, 131.3 with the G29, and then a 131 flat with the DualSense. So when it's all said and done, the Pro Wheel performed best overall, and set the fastest average lap every time that it wasn't the first device being used, which highlights the importance of fair testing. While using a direct drive system absolutely contributed to a more realistic driving experience, I don't think it necessarily improved my pace, and my intuition is that the low tail pedal had a bigger impact, as it allowed for more effective trail braking. This resulted in higher exit speeds, which probably allowed me to shave a couple of tenths off every corner. It wasn't significantly faster though, and there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to achieve similar results after a bit of practice using a spring-loaded pedal. The G29 was hardly a slouch, and I was able to set fairly comparable lap times, which I'm sure I could have improved after some time calibrating my inputs. Generally speaking, I was also much more consistent with the Pro Wheel and pedals. There's a couple of factors which I think contributed to this, but the main one is that having more detailed feedback meant that I felt much more connected to the car, and provided me with more signals on whether I was pushing too hard, leading to less driving errors. Driving with the DualSense controller allows you to rotate to full steering lock with a flick of the thumb, which encourages you to get on the power a lot earlier because it's way faster and easier to correct oversteer and therefore drive closer to the limit. Because of this, you're able to pull off maneuvers and racing lines that aren't really possible on a wheel unless you have the steering angle tuned down to an unrealistic amount. This meant that I was actually able to set some of my fastest laps using a controller, but the reduced fidelity meant that I was also much less consistent and led to more mistakes which ultimately affected my average lap time. The lack of dexterity and smoothness meant that a controller is typically slower on circuits and more technical layouts, like the S's at Suzuka for example, and is best suited to tracks with big braking zones where you have to get back on the power early like turns 1 and 2 at Red Bull Ring. Pace aside, using a controller just wasn't as much fun as using a wheel and pedals, so I really think most people will get much more enjoyment out of using a sim racing rig. Still, I found it interesting to include it in this comparison, and made some of the incidents I've experienced in multiplayer races make a lot more sense. So, does expensive sim racing gear make you faster? Probably not by any significant margin, but the quality of life improvements can make a big difference to your overall experience, and definitely help justify the increased cost. If you enjoyed this video, you should check out my comparison of the Logitech G Pro Wheel and Pedals to Fanatec's recently released Gran Turismo DD Extreme. Either way, thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next one.